very quickly you start realizing there is a disconnect between your value proposition what at the core of what you're doing is what you're offering and how your potential buyers understand what the value proposition is there's a big disconnect in between there and the outcome was people were not buying into what you were selling because very basically because at the end of the day remember whatever product you're selling nobody cares what i care is so if you're not able to articulate what you're doing to that person's life as they wake up in the morning as they go about their life as they hustle as they do whatever else they're doing when they wake up then you are selling yourself short what is it that i'm actually looking for do we really know life sure. but let me say intelligence emotional intelligence social intelligence financial intelligence so i believe it's important for each and every one of us to understand the rules that govern in your arena of your life you are listening to the revenge of the forsaken gods a podcast that explores the human experience and seeks to create a blueprint for living using books stories movies and conversations and here is your host andrew balongo opere are you a professional who wants to use your expertise to build a life worth waking up to whether it's in your job for yourself or for your own business are you someone that wants to change their life do you want to rebel against the average against the status quo and stop denying that gift that is sleeping inside of you are you ready to unleash the beast Well, my guest is ready to help you with that. And for 15 years and over, she has made brands undeniable. She's made businesses grow by simplifying the complex. And she does that because it's based out of rabid curiosity, helping connect unrelated fields for unexpected results, research and deep experience, so that your positioning Growth and clarity challenges do not overwhelm you because she says it's simple if you know how. So without further ado, let me bring on the lady that is undeniable, unignorable. Kawire Rambu, welcome. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And you have such a cool name, Kawire Irambu. You know, where, where is that name from? And what does Kabira mean? What does Irambu mean? Okay, so um, in my culture, and I'm from Meru. Is, this Meru is in Kenya. So in my culture, you're typically named after somebody in your family line. Okay, so. Full disclosure. First of all, Irambu is my surname, so it's a family name, and it's my grandfather's name, and it means someone who is fussy. So you're very particular about how you like your stuff done. So that's what Irambu means in Meru, and Kawira is my mom named me after her sister, and it means the one that works hard. I guess Meru's didn't know about working smart, but he's the one who works hard. Yeah. Well, uh, but evidently you've been working hard to get to the position that uh, you have reached right now, and I'm just wondering how particular and fussy are you? You know, did you get that from your grandpa? <laughs> Ooh. Um. If it's genetic, for sure. I did it it's genetic but uh, um, I wouldn't say so I wouldn't say that it passed on from my grandfather yeah no not really but it is genetic for sure it was passed on yeah yes yes yeah mm. so talking about the things you've inherited how did you inherit the this drive to be in branding and marketing was it was it uh, automatic or you know because i'm thinking for you to be in this for 15 years uh-huh you must have some passion some purpose around this well, it's 
interesting. It actually started out as an accident. I had no classical training in marketing up until very recent. My background is in computer science and mathematics. And my first job who was in operations, I know, absolutely unrelated. And that first job was just killing me. I was dying. I was dying. I mean, I was the literal interpretation of a blip in the corporate ladder, rad, radar, rather. I was just a something, you know. And it didn't sit well with me because I know the kind of person I am. I typically, for whatever reason, have always been involved in things that need to get involved in. And it was painful to see myself fade into the background of everything that was happening. So maybe the Irambu in me was like, no, this is not working. And I had a discussion with my HR talent manager then, and I was so terrified, I remember. It took a lot of push from my now partner to just go and sit down and say, I, I think I am misplaced. I think I'm doing, I'm just, I feel lost in whatever I'm doing, but I did. And I think maybe the choice of words that I used, I'm lost. I feel like I'm not contributing to the business. I'm fading. She was like, you would be good in marketing for whatever reason. Those are the words that came out of her mouth. And in some way, she likely sealed my fate because after that, we had, so the agreement we had after that discussion is the next time there is a marketing role that is available, apply. And in the interim, just so that I could set myself up for apply, I would speak to people in marketing. What do you do? In my mind then, marketing was making noise. So I would help to make noise. There is a campaign that needs to be done, volunteer, we need to go to the station, volunteer. So eventually when the role was advertised, I applied, sorry, I applied, I got the interview, I interviewed for the role, and I got the role. Of course, looking back, probably they shouldn't have given me the role, but I did, and just on the job, the awareness of how inept I was forced me to go back to school. So, many years later, here we are. Wow, wow. And uh, one of the interesting things is, you know, you've worked for a multinational. <laughs> and something that I've noticed on the ground here is that Multinational do things differently than locals. You know, I had a conversation with uh, a, a podcast guest and he told me that his experience in the multinational, there's a lot of training and what have you. And I would just like to find out from you, how was your experience working at the multinational you're working at? So I'd love to first ask you, Maybe what are three major things? I want you to picture, you're talking to yourself on day one. You've never, you know, you've wow. never worked in a multinational. Think of Kawira day one and you have to give her that conversation to help her level up as fast as humanly possible. What would be three major things you would tell her? And just unpack the times when that made sense for you, how you got that wisdom experience for you. Okay, I'll, I'll give a disclaimer before I get into it, yeah. To be honest, yeah, to be very honest, multinational versus local, of course, you have the background of prior experience. In fact, we have a joke just amongst my friends that when you're working with a brand that has global presence, your role in brand is significantly less than when you're working with a local brand because then the work that you have to do to level up is significantly more 
a say a lot of startup or a newer business compared to a brand that has been in existence for 100 years, 65 years or more because they figured out most of the things. To know voice is that we're not figuring out brand archetypes, we're not figuring out colors and logos and brand assets and how to show up and communication kits and strategy and many things. But when you have on the flip side, a startup or a new business or just a local business, the amount of effort you put in is significantly more because it's almost as though you're building it from the ground up. So you'll do a lot of foundational work versus on the other side where you'll do maybe um, maintenance or growth, but the base has already been set. So you're working from somewhere as opposed to inventing everything as you move along. Okay. Thank so, you. And uh, go ahead. Uh, it's okay. Um, no, no. You mentioned you you mentioned some interesting things. You're the first person I've ever had mentioning brand archetype. You know, I haven't had that being mentioned in Kenya at all. So, would you mind expounding a little bit on that? What is a brand archetype? And then after we're done with that, you mentioned about having the fundamental of a brand having the maintaining a brand and growing a brand maybe you could just go a little bit what's needed for for those three steps the mindset and and, and way of execution both on your end as a brand manager slash custodian and even for the business owner maybe who has engaged your services what do they need what kind of mindset do they need to allow you to fully execute your mandate, your duties. Okay. Okay, there's so many questions. I don't know. So let's start with the brand that's... archetype, yes. What is that? Okay. okay. It's, 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 um, okay. So very foundational stuff, yeah? An archetype, I would say, is a personification of the brand. And it's a personification that is based on globally understood truths. So if I tell you uh, this person is a sage, they are a wise person, or they are an every everyday man, you're, or you're a magician, or you're a joker, or basically it's a way to dress up your brand so that when it shows up in the marketplace, it is received well. So if I say I am creating a brand for the for every man, yeah, think of equity. If you know, if I was to think of an every man archetype in Kenya, it would be equity. So it is a brand that is meant to be consumed or patronized by your ordinary people. It has no airs around it, it's very functional. It understands its job and it gets the job done. It's affordable. It's a brand for the masses. Then I would say something like a sage archetype. So this is somebody that is typically wise. So even your value in society or in the community where you operate is add value, give information, guidance. You're a thought leader in something. So if you have that as the back end, you understand what your role in that community is or within your consumers are. So that's what an archetype does. And it helps even when you're doing campaigns to know that I need to show up as. So, for example, if you're used to knowing me as somebody who's very laid back, and then tomorrow I come and I show up absolutely different from what you know me. That's, it just, it's, there is no, it doesn't, What's the word? It doesn't tally up. So it just helps with consistency, which is what people learn to know from you and probably keeps you relevant because what a sage knows today and what a sage knows yesterday are different and they evolve. So are you up to date with the information you have? Things like that. Yeah. Where else... Can people find more information about about brand archetypes? Because it really 
shows that through brand archetypes, people can really find how to express themselves, can I say authentically, or from where they're coming from. Okay. It gives it actually gives them <laughs> the tools from what it sounds like when you're describing it. It does. It does. Um, I So two sources. Uh, the first one, a quick Google search will tell you who brand archetypes are and how you can apply them and how useful they can be in what you do for your brand. Um, if you're starting off on your business and you probably don't even know where do I start from, because when you're starting a business, you first want to just open doors and do the basics. So just from having done this, even for my partner, you understand those things that you imagine are obvious and are very basic are not. So people will end up building a business that doesn't have, I want to say maybe a soul or a foundation. So when it shows up in the marketplace, it just blown all over the place. It's like tumbleweed. Anything blows, it goes any direction. But when you take the time to set the foundations right, decide on your reasons to believe, your positioning, your tone of voice, your brand architecture, all those things, it it helps. It makes a difference. Even when people interact with that, there's some safety, there's some consistency, there's what they learn to know that is promised from doing business with you, which is what a brand is, yeah? I know that when I call, my call will be picked. I know when I DM, it will, I'll have a response in two minutes or whatever amount of time. I just, there is some comfort, I guess, in interacting with a business where you're clear on what your expectations are and they keep the promise. So I put together what I call like a starter kit. I know there's this joke locally where we say, this is... A Kali starter kit. So you need this, this, and this to show up properly as a Kali. So it's the same thing. It's a starter kit. It's very easy to consume. It literally has checkboxes. So do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And if you do all those things, honestly, your head and shoulders above other people, or you show up better, or you inspire more confidence, not just in your potential customers, but even people who want to partner with you. So I, it's, it's free, it's absolutely free of charge. It's just that understanding that it could help somebody else. And this is information that, you know, it's like salt. You, I guess, would never have a scarcity of salt. So it's my way of salt to the earth. Yeah. And Thank where you can you download that, that? It's on my LinkedIn profile. You just download it from there. Okay. And on LinkedIn, they find you at... Irambo Kawera. Irambo okay, and I'll also put Kawera Hadwaki. Yeah. And I'll also put that link in the show notes so that you can click and go ahead and download those those two documents, the starter pack or the starter kit. And you know it's one thing to uh, you know to do the check boxes and Google it. Sometimes I just don't, people just don't have time. I want just the professional to come and deal with it because you said yourself that you helped your partner. And actually, you know, I've had the privilege of a, 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 an interesting accident where I did not know I had worked with your partner is in the education technology space. Now, a lot of people are in the technology education space. Okay, would you mind just sharing a little bit of the journey? How did he present his brand? What did you see was lacking? And what did you help turn things around? And what was the effect <laughs> of your branding uh, implementation? Okay. So, of course, it's his full permission, hopefully. He simply started a business, you know, I am doing this, I'm in the ad space, I'm going to do an app, I am going to market the app. But then very quickly you start realizing there's a disconnect between your value proposition, what at the core of what you're doing is what you're offering and how your potential buyers understand what the value proposition is. 
there's a big disconnect in between there. And the outcome was people were not buying into what he was selling because very basically they didn't understand how your offer adds value to my life. Because at the end of the day, remember, whatever product you're selling, nobody cares. What I care is the pain you're taking away from me or the value that you're adding for me. So if you're not able to articulate what you're doing to that person's life as they wake up in the morning, as they go about their life, as they hustle, as they do whatever else they're doing when they wake up, then you are selling yourself short. And so the consistent struggle was this product, when I finally, you know, shove it down people's throats, they're like, so, you know, we went back and did very basic things for, and we... Okay, before the basic things, how uh, did he present his value proposition? Uh... Specifically. And you said, and yeah, specifically because you said people were not getting Sorry. it. It's okay. okay. Because you said people were not getting it. Okay. So um, he is in the ed space, and what he does, he has an app that helps the primary level school teachers put out CBC based reports that make sense. I mean, if you ask anyone who has a CBC student, they'll tell you, I don't know what CBC is. All I know is that somehow I do homework instead of my son or instead of my daughter. So I imagine in that confusion of we don't know what CBC is, then you're the person who has an app for CBC. So your app comes to do what exactly? Add to the confusion. So imagine a pitch to a principal, to a board director, or to a school owner about your app. And I think I even did a sample of this in one of my LinkedIn posts. A big problem he had is, number one, when he onboarded onto schools, when he had the one-on-one -on -one with the principal to explain what the app does, which essentially is to track a learner's in-class performance so that you're able to track what we call formative. I can't remember what the other stuff is, formative. Is something else. Basically, there's two types of these two types of tests that learners are taken through. So the school owner would agree to the app, then pass it on to the teacher. Then the teacher wouldn't use the app. So you have an app that someone is paying for that no one is using. So the big challenge was how do we get the teachers to use the app? Because in using the app. We start seeing the benefits, aka how the students are performing. And very importantly, a report that would take, so students would close school and teachers would stay behind because they would need to do the reports manually so that they can then send the report. And as is, a teacher is already complaining, I have so many learners in my class. I can't keep up. The syllabus has changed. All these things has worked. So how do you position that app so that the teacher cares? And when we sat down, got and basically put on the teacher's shoes and understood why they're not using the app is because I already have all these things to do. Now your app wants me to do one more thing. I'm not going to do it because I don't see it adding value to my life. So the messaging was there for, you know, um, I can't remember the exact words, but it was to the effect that do what you do in two weeks, in two hours. So basically, we free you to go and have fun as well. You know, I think it was even teachers deserve to have fun or to play. So reports in two hours versus two weeks. I mean, who wouldn't want to use that? Yeah, and this was not an outcome of the business or my product is very good. It's just that thing of flipping and thinking of the end consumer versus yourself. What do they care about? What is their pain? And how can you talk to that so that they care? So maybe that's the direct example to speak to how that brand was helped to show up better in the marketplace. Wow, that was very powerful because a lot of people, I can see how a lot of people make that same mistake that your partner did and communicating the benefits in a very tangible way 
I think is something a lot of entrepreneurs and businesses fail at. And 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 since we took a little bit of a tangent, I remember we, we were unlocking the experience of a multinational where you said that the experience seems to be more of maintaining the brand because they've done the difficult work of putting all the assets, putting all the uh, all the brand building blocks together. So compared to the local environment that has to do everything from scratch. So is there any other thing you wanted to share about the experience from being in a multinational before now we continue still adding what are the fundamentals, brand fundamentals a business needs to have in place? If a brand is already in place, what do they need to manage it? And then also, what does a brand need to do to grow themselves? Okay. So maybe to speak on, maybe I can respond to that by answering the question you asked at the beginning, which is, it's Kavira, it's day one, you're working for this big brand. So, you know, what would you say in retrospect? Um, so when you're working for a big brand, I guess you have the benefit of resources, right? You're working with agencies and different people in agencies. You have an account manager, you have the person who does the creative, you have the person who does strategy, you have the person who does your activation, you have the person who's on the ground, you have the person who's buying media. So that's where that need to simplify the complex comes in. The more complex your brief is, the more susceptible it is to interpretation. I will interpret it my own way. I had... I had a guy who gave an example that his wife once went to bed before him and told him, there's food on the oven. Please just put the food away before you go to bed. And the guy went, he put all the pots in the fridge very meticulously because he knows his wife is another Iram. And the next day, his wife wakes up and is like, what did you do? Like, why did you put the pots in the fridge? He's like, that's what you said. So what the wife meant is remove the food from the pots naturally. Put it in dishes. Put the dishes in the fridge. Wash the pots and put them away. But that's not what she communicated. That's what she meant. But that's what she said. So that's not what was understood. So that's not what was done. And so it's the same thing when you work for a big brand. When you're communicating with all these stakeholders, the sales team, finance team, about budgets I need, timelines I need, procurement, you have a big campaign that's supposed to go live at a certain date. Do you have the buy-in from the different stakeholders? And is what you're trying to do understood simply? Or did you communicate, put the pots or put the food away, which is subject to interpretation? Or even worse still, do you have a very complicated, long brief? People don't like to read. You have things to do. People don't read simple things like captions. So say what you need to say. Say it concisely and say it simply so that there is no room for interpretation, which means you have to do the same thing over, which reduces your efficiency and likely your effectiveness. So that is number one. Take a sip of water, sorry, I have a cold. Sorry. It's okay. Then you asked what should Kavira do? The value of people, right? Yes, you need, you're responsible for the brand. That's true. But you're not going to succeed on your own. It is impossible to succeed on your own. So... Are you listening to your clients, internal clients, the sales team? Do you know what their problems are? Do you understand what the challenges are in the marketplace? Just keep yourself open to hearing a different perspective that is not yours. And I keep saying that the marketer is not the market, right? You might say, 
yeah, but this should work because I would do this. You're not the ideal client profile, so you can have an opinion, but it's not about you again. You're not the market, so take yourself out. Take yourself out. Give yourself an opportunity to look at the problem with a different set of eyes. It unlocks things that you can actually base your campaign or whatever it is on. And then maybe the third one is what you don't communicate simply is not understood. You don't say something, people won't read your mind, they won't know what you mean, they won't do it. So if you need something done, say it, say it simply, then it's done. Wow, wow, those are very three powerful lessons from from working in a multinational that I think that not only is it beneficial to Irambu Kawira of day one, but even to the local environment, they could use those three um, those three uh, guidelines to 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 further their business forward. And I guess we can now go to the, the, the second part of the, of the question is uh, maybe what are three fundamentals someone, it's okay. What are three fundamentals that someone starting out needs to have in place? And then finally, when the business is, 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 is growing, what do they need to do to maintain their brand? And lastly, what is it that an individual can do to grow their brand? And even as you're sharing the three things, please do mention the mistakes that they tend to do and how they can overcome those mistakes. Okay. Um, do you mind repeating the first question? I didn't get it. Sure. The three questions are, what are the fundamentals that someone who is starting their own enterprise needs to have in place? And I guess as you're mentioning those three, it's easy to mention the mistakes that they overlook. And then once a brand, you know, someone has done their business uh, for a while, what do they need to do to maintain their brand if they're doing the right things? And then lastly, what does someone need to do to grow their brand if they feel it's plateaued or it's just, you know, it's just there and they want it to grow. Okay. This, uh, this is what the question um, <laughs> Okay, so fundamentals to have in place. Um, so if you think about marketing, the fundamentals are very clear and I know these schools of thoughts that are different from what I'm going to say, but it's, it's my view. Fundamentals, four Ps, right? We get into marketing sometimes, and I have the experience of people only focusing on promotion, which is communication, and forgetting the other four Ps. This product, you know, have you built your product well? Does it serve an actual purpose? Is it a great product? that people would want or that would add value in someone's life, right? Product. Then price. Have you thought about how your product is priced? Is there a reason? Is it just cost plus? I want margin X. Or does it, is it thoughtful in the way you've put your pricing so that when somebody is told, say a subscription is 2,000 bob, but if you go annual, it's 5,000 bob, then you're getting more of the people who would maybe go annual versus monthly. So think about your pricing and think about the value it's adding. Have you priced it well for what it's doing? And then there is place. How do you show up? How do you distribute your product? Are you easily accessible? So do you have a great product that no one can buy? That is difficult to get to. That is not consistently available. So it's almost as though we have to do a wait list every time we want to buy, I don't know, your mangoes. So places, the distribution is very important. And then, of course, there is promotion. Do people know what you're doing? Do they really, really know the value that you are adding to their lives? And I was trying to say this previously, there is a benefit ladder to it. 
So it's everything from functionally, what are you doing for me right now in the moment? If it's um, Coca-Cola, it's a cold drink. Functionally, it takes away my thirst, but it's, I don't know, it's, it's a good accompaniment after a meal, right? It features, it comes in a plastic bottle, it has zero sugar, it can, it can be in a plastic bottle, but then there is that higher level up without solving world hunger and all those other things, just emotionally, emotively, it makes me happy, right? It's, it's a pick me up at the end of a bad day or at the beginning of a bad day, depending on who you are. So also understand what information needs to be with your consumer or with your buyer at what time so that you're not overwhelming them with information that they can't keep or base it to make info to make a decision so fundamentals I me mean, i just i'm a i'm a purist like that i'll go to the basics get your four p's right now these seven p's i'm sure there's 16 of them also so just get your basics right i say you know that James Bond expression? Your mission, should you accept it, is to, is to get the four Ps right. Get your product, your price, your place, your promotions right. Then everything else builds on top of that. So Metan is actually mission impossible, but uh, <laughs> yes. Who's counting? Yeah. <laughs> Who's counting? Right. And, 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 and I've noticed... Thank you. Thank you about that, yeah. And, and I've noticed you mentioned about the marketing fundamentals for you is marketing and branding the same or how, how are they different? Yeah. Um, at the end of the day is it's about capturing the demand, you know, this demand for something. Are you able to position your product so that someone cares for it? I honestly, I'm not caught up in the definitions of what is, what is it. I know a brand is simply what do people say or think about when you're not in the room. What do people recognize? What do people know about you? It's recognizable. It includes the physical things that come about it. But I would argue you can use them, in my opinion, interchangeably. Yeah. But then okay. one, you see, like, you... If, if you think about a brand, it can be owned by the business. I can put it in my balance sheet. In my, I, I can have it as something that I can put a value to. Would I say I can do that with marketing? But it's the what you do. The other one is more of an asset. But it's still something that you need to build because it adds value to the business. So marketing and all of these things help build the perception of the business. So I guess brand is how it is perceived and that'll determine if people interact with it more. And if you have future business. And if you have future business. Wow, those are really solid fundamentals that I think a lot of people might overlook. You know, because I notice even like with what you've named as examples, it's very easy to name Coca-Cola. It's very easy to name equity. It's very easy to name, you know, the big players. And so when someone is starting out and they may start out maybe not in that field, I can easily see how they may, for lack of a better word, violate the fundamentals. Like making sure, like, taking for granted that they're not easily accessible. Like if someone has uh, expertise, right? And they have expertise that help, you know, shift how businesses think so that businesses can make more money. Especially nowadays, people are utilizing social media and they might not have a physical space. They might be working from their office, but probably they haven't listed their office as a place where people can meet, but it's difficult to meet them. Like the customer doesn't know where they can access them or their thought leadership. And so that one is they're hurting themselves because they haven't had that fundamental of place 
put in. And I guess if they are not having that place uh, uh, put in check, it affects also promotion. They really don't put themselves out there. So how can you then, before we move on to you know maintaining and growing, people who have expertise that don't have a physical location, how can they put the four Ps for their business? So are we talking about digital products? Or digital products, or let's say people who say people who say I can help you with your branding or I'm a marketing consultant or I'm a coach. I have this information because I've worked at this business or this organization for X amount of years. So I can help you with strategy. I can help you with the structure. I can help you with systems. But they don't have a physical location. Mm. How can a person with expertise utilize the four Ps for their expertise now properly? Okay, so for clarity, when I say place, it doesn't necessarily mean physical. So think of it as a channel. How does your product or your value proposition get to the person who should be consuming it? So it could be through an app. It could be through social media. You could have, you could be selling your stuff, which happens today. Sell it on TikTok, sell it on IG, uh, create content on LinkedIn. So provided it is easy for your end consumer to interact with you. There is no effort on their part. You have it right. And you're easily accessible, readily accessible. That's okay. So it doesn't matter whether it's digital or whatever else. You just need to make sure that it is easy for whatever you're selling to be consumed by your potential consumers. It doesn't have to be physical. It does not need to be physical. It doesn't. It just needs to be accessible. Whether that's digital or otherwise, it's your choice. And it's also, of course, based on your consumer profile. It could even be both or more or all of them con combined. So it doesn't limit you from where I sit. I think what you've shared is a challenge for a lot of entrepreneurs because they do what's comfortable for them to execute on and not what is easy for the consumer to find them. I find those two different. Mm. So because uh, I'm not really a social media person, I don't put myself out there. Or if I am, maybe I, um, I'm, I like LinkedIn, but maybe my customers are on TikTok. So... I find that uh, an interesting challenge that uh, entrepreneurs with expertise have. Oof. You see, and here's the catch-22, yeah? Because there's both ways of looking at it. Uh. There is the outcome where your strengths, and again, now maybe we'll be going to strategy because it's about choices. You cannot be everywhere. So you also have to choose based on your strengths. What am I good at and what works for me? So now segue to strategy. It's, you can't do everything for everyone all the time. You have to make trade-offs. So if I'm good on LinkedIn and I'm not good at TikTok, maybe when I go to TikTok, I might dilute what I'm doing or I might, I don't know, whatever. It's, it's about choices. The thing to remember is your choice has a consequence. So whatever choice you make, are you ready for the consequences? So as you see, as an example on LinkedIn and you snap TikTok, as an example, as a channel, are you okay with the consequences of that? Which is that potentially you may not be able to capture a certain segment of your consumers. Which if, if it's a trade-off that you're making that I will sacrifice this because of this, then it's a choice you've made. You also bear the consequences that come with that. Yeah, so wow. I guess long story short, it's not a one size fits all. Yeah, you you can make a I know people who have taken the conscious decision not to be on Facebook because it doesn't serve them. But then when you look at our statistics, our statistics 
words, 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 words. When you look at our statistics, Facebook as a social media has the highest volume, right? But then functionally, they are just not thriving there despite the attempt to. So it's taking more time to get those returns by being on that platform than compared to maybe focusing on the other channels that they have. So it's a trade-off that they've made. They know that there is the numbers there, but I've tried it for this long and it's not working. So there is a lesson to take and to move on and capitalize on other things that actually work. Wow. Wow. This is so simple. Only if you know how. (laughs) Only if you know how. how. And, you know, uh, if I can get back to what you said about simplicity, yeah? I previously have had an MD that was an engineer and he always used to have this thing for break it down to fast principles, right? Whatever the big problem is, just pull it apart. Pull it apart, then deal with the different parts. It gets easier that way because when you attempt to solve the problem, like what you've talked about, the guy in the educational space, if the brief was, I just want more retention, without breaking why, why do we have teachers not using the product? Why are principals churning? Why are schools churning? Without breaking it down to root cause, you may end up solving the wrong problem and it might be a complex problem. So that thing of asking the right questions, it actually helps. It helps. It helps. It just you even feel when you have the solution with you. So just simplifying that complex, I think, is the one lesson from the engineer MD of things are complex. That's just life. But break it apart oh. and solve for the puzzles. It helps. Thank you for, for helping connect that unrelated field to give us an unexpected result in a different way of thinking. And uh, it's okay. And uh, yes, I'd like us to take a small break. And when we come back from the break, I'd like us just to expand a little bit on first principles. For those of us that don't have the privilege to have engineers in our lives, we can get to know what first principles is, that we can use that thinking in our career and in our business. And then also... You've, you've, you've turned the table around to strategy, so we'll go a little bit deeper into that. So we will be right back. This is Irambo Kawira, and you're listening undeniably to the Revenge of the Forsaken Gods podcast. Enjoy. Welcome back to the Revenge of the Forsaken Gods podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Balongo Pere, and if you're just tuning in, I am with... Kawira Irambo. She is a brand and marketing practitioner and with over 15 years of experience, she's worked in the local market with a multinational and one of her guarantees is she's going to make life for you simple so that uh, you can be able to get things done in your business. And just before the break, she was just talking about how her former boss, an MD, was an engineer and was... unlocked for her about first systems thinking and i'm like i don't have any engineers in my life can you please explain for me what this first systems thinking is so i can use it in my life okay okay so a, a the way it was put to be is this first principle so let's imagine that you have a laptop right and your laptop is not working. What does somebody who typically fixes your laptop do? They diagnose it, right? They will do the basic checks. Is, I don't know, is it the hardware or is it the software? If it's the hardware, is it that your trackpad isn't working or is it your speaker or is it the power button? Is it your ports? What, what exactly is not working? So there is a systematic way of breaking it down as opposed to let's solve the computer problem. You break it down to things that can be done. Kids do this so well. Um, When you 
say that, I don't know, it is raining outside, they'll ask you why. Have you ever asked yourself why it's raining? It's just raining because it's raining. So yeah. then you have to think it's raining because the clouds have condensed, so there's rain. Then they're like, why did the clouds condense? Then you have to answer that question. Then whatever answer you give to the clouds condensed, they'll be like, what is a cloud? Then you have to explain that. It's formed from water, then where does the water come from? It evaporates from the ground. Then what causes the water to evaporate from the ground? So by going back that way, if I ask you, therefore, why does it rain? It just doesn't rain because it's raining. It rains because at some point there was heat. The heat caused the water to evaporate. The water evaporated, it builds into a cloud, and finally the rain let down. That's why it's raining. So it's just that level of asking questions. And practically, I had this very useful practical example from a copywriter that I follow. So it's a business that has launched a feature, right? Let's imagine it's a recording business, okay? And see what we're doing today with the podcast? We are recording it. You have to go to the back end and edit out when I say, mm, ah, mm. And what it forces you to do as somebody who's building content, sometimes you have to start over because you keep messing it up, right? So their video recording had a way of cutting out all the ums and ahs and damn, I didn't get that right. It could automatically cut those portions out and just give you a stitched version that made sense. So typically, when we are going to market with a new feature, I'll be like, I'm very excited to launch this new feature. We are very excited. So the first principle reasoning is, okay, you have that feature, right? So what? And I think we've played this in the past. So what? You have a new feature, so what? I have a new feature, so your recordings can be done more effectively. So what? Um, it means you spend less time with your video editing. So what? So maybe you have more time to spend with your family. If you keep going, so what? You may go so far back that you solve world hunger. But the first principles thinking is just that thing of going deeper or digging deeper into the problem. So that, as an example, when they launched the so what was opere, we don't have to spend three hours editing your video. Yeah, we'll take out the as and ums and whatever. So your video editing or your video recording experience is better for you. It's not about the feature again. It's about the client. So that's first principles, just going back and asking what went wrong, why did it go wrong, what can I do about it, how can I solve for that? Like, at the root of it, how can I help better? Can I give you another example? Sure. If I sell tablets, am I selling technology? If I'm selling that tablet to a parent, or am I selling a babysitter? A babysitter. So you're saying, it's okay. At the end of the day, it's tech. It has all the features. It has this screen. It has this. It has this RAM. It has this. But to a mom, if they're buying the tablet for a kid or even for family use, do they care about the RAM? Yeah, it's useful functionally. But if you hook it as, it's two hours of quiet when you're with your family. It's more compelling. So it's just that thing of going to, I am living my life as a customer or as a client or as a potential buyer. How are you coming to add value to my life? If businesses and I kept you ask this question, I probably didn't respond to it. You want to grow? Think about how you usefully add value to your consumer as they live their life today or take away a headache. You take away a pain. 
then people start listening and thinking, okay, maybe it makes sense for me to with them. So that's first principles and it also answers the other question you asked. So you're trying to tell me that kids are born engineers and we we train them out of being engineers. Stop asking me those questions. <laughs> uh, I, yeah. I, I, I have two of them. It, I, I see how we stop them from being engineers. Sometimes maybe because of energy and time, we just tap out. So, yeah. But I don't think we do it from a bad place. It's just a consequence of adulting. Indeed, indeed. So at least you've mentioned one aspect that a person can grow their brand, which is first principles, thinking thinking from the mind of a consumer and alleviating their pain. Are there any other, maybe two more things yeah. that someone can grow their brand? And I think we've not yet touched on maintaining their brand. Okay. Um, um, this is going to be very easy for me. And it's based on this. There's a terminology we use in the industry. We have somebody who calls G. He's the godfather of brands. I can't remember his name for the love of me. I can't Seth publish Gordon? it after the Seth. No. No, it's not Seth. Um, I, I, I'll find out and yeah. I'll, I'll probably come to me as I go uh, this through this. So the guy says, brand growth, two things. Mental availability, physical availability. So do people think about you in buying moments? Do they? When I think I want something to drink, who am I thinking about? Am I thinking about you? In, I'm living my life, remember we said this, yeah? So it's both mental availability and physical availability. If you want to grow, you have to invest your time in this. You have to be physically available. I need to buy your product, I can get it, it's easy. So you're not shortchanging yourself by creating the mental availability that people think about you in buying situations. But then when it's time to actually spend their money, it is difficult to complete that transaction. So both in their heads, in their lives, as they're living their lives, start showing up usefully in there, right? In the teacher's case, they deserve to take a break also, right? So they can spend more time with their family when school is closed. They can also close, they can go skip rope, play with their kids and all those things. So you've already, you've planted something in their mind. So using this app actually helps my life. So when I want to be more effective, I can actually push. Can we have this app in our school? Because it helps me do this, this, and this. When it's time to make that buying decision, are your prices clear? Are they upfront? Are they transparent? Are your terms and conditions clear? When I'm completing that purchase, is it easy to complete that purchase? Because it doesn't, it's not useful for you to do all this then when it's time to actually complete the purchase, I can't or I'm unable to or it's difficult or it doesn't work. So those two have to really just be in place. Wow, wow. Do, do the same principles apply for maintaining a brand? Um... By maintaining, we mean relevance. Well, because I remember you mentioned it earlier. I guess I, I was assuming that there are different <laughs> uh, stages. You know, there's okay. the fun when someone is starting out. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, when someone is growing and then maintaining. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure at what level. Maybe you can give some clarity to when someone yeah, is maintaining their brand. Okay, so I would say it's probably just remaining relevant as the marketplace evolves. 
you know, these things to think about your, your consumer segment evolves. They, they may, for lack of a better word, they may age, right? So if I started a brand in 1983, right? Let's even think of KCC, right? And by then, maybe my biggest segment was 40 years old. In 2024, that consumer segment has aged. Their consumption habits have changed. They probably don't buy your product as much, or maybe they buy your product more, depending on what your product does for them. So that need to stay relevant, not just as a brand, but how you solve the problems and probably even recruit a new segment so that your business has future revenue. So that's what I meant. And there's a lot of research involved in this. Understand the needs, understand what the marketplace is doing, understand what values your new consumer market or your aging consumer market. What values are they starting to embrace? What do they care for? Are you that brand or are you still stuck in your ways? And don't get me wrong, Brands don't need to rebrand. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying be relevant to the segment that you want to address. And again, back to strategy. Do you even care for the new generation of consumers? Or have you made the strategic choice that I don't care for them? I'm only going to go with the oldies. And so at some point then, you've aged yourself out of the market. So that's what maintaining means is understanding how the marketplace, the competition, your preferences for your consumers, the choice drivers, how are they evolving over time so that you remain relevant and you can keep serving them usefully, adding value. It's not about you again, it's about them. So that's what I meant by maintenance work. And it, it shows up in different ways. It's research, it's positioning, it's, it's many things. It's the packages that you put across so that maybe your younger audience consumes you. It's the things you stand for. Maybe your archetype no longer makes sense. It's, it's many things, but that's the maintenance job. Wow. And, and even as you're mentioning that, what comes to mind for me is alcohol brands. How they're still relevant and the amount of research that they do and I remember speaking to a marketing research professional and, you know, he asked me, what segment do I think that they are targeting? And I thought they were targeting, you know, uh, 30, between the 30 to 40 segment. And they were like, no, we're targeting uh, 18 to 25. And I was like, after I explained it, it made sense to me, you know, because once someone has made their habits, in regards to alcohol, they're going, they're not really going to change. You know, you find people saying, I'm a, this kind of person, I'm a beer person, I'm a wine person, I'm a spirits person. So the amount of, I guess alcohol is one of the industries that know how to listen to, to their consumers compared to the under in industries that I've observed. And I find that very interesting. And uh, yes, I'd like us to, to switch a, a little bit gears because I noticed that of your skill sets, in fact, the main reason how we, we met on LinkedIn in the DMs was your, your passionate about helping professionals unlock their expertise for their lives. And they don't have to quit their job. They can do this within their job. If they're having their side hustle that they've activated, they can bring in, you know, the expertise into their side business and uh, even to into their career. What was the uh, inspiration behind doing this? Okay. Uh, that's a good one. Um, Fred, what was the inspiration behind 
helping people to become unignorable. That's that's it, yeah. Okay. I I have said this to anyone who will give me a listening ear. I have been average for so many years. I, I know what average looks like, right? I know what it is to be passed on for promotion, for many things, just because your furniture, yeah, you, you're just, I said a blip in the corporate ladder, you know? We just know you're available or you're accessible when the radar goes, then you pin. And I have blamed many people for, I can't succeed because this, this, that, but then they were all excuses. And what unlocked it for me, um, I'm part of a brand managers group and we had an event that was put together and one of the speakers in that forum was like, it's interesting that the things we do for our brands or the brands we work with, we don't do for ourselves. Yet we help the brands succeed. We do. I mean, that's your KPI at the end of the day. So if you're doing this, for a business and for a brand, is it a shame that you're not doing it for yourself? Have you ever felt a penny drop? Like, you're like, yeah, I accept the challenge. And I was so angry with myself to know that I was that person. So, by the way, simple to, you know, sometimes when you're exposed, it's shameful. Sat down with myself. All those things I'd been doing for the brands, I was like, if there's truth in what she said, let me try and see if it's true. And I've done it now for close to a year. I mean, it's I can tell you the change for me. I, I, I know what it was a year ago or even three years back. And just that intentionality of managing even myself as a brand, it really makes a difference. So just that unlock and that understanding of if you move yourself from I'm just a tool, I show up at work, I go back, I show up at work, I go up. There's really no difference between yourself and a hammer because you're not investing in yourself, you're not showing up, you know, you're not showing up for yourself. Like you could be a Ferrari, but every day when I behave to come a pro box, you know, so it's just, it's that unlock for me that you could actually be more by just being aware or doing the things that you do in your nine to five for yourself. So that's, that's the backstory of being that paired with, I had a HR in my previous life who made this comment that you want a promotion and if I throw a stone, outside this window, it could hit somebody who could come here and replace you. Just take a moment and think about that. So that thing for I will not be ignored, I will not be ignored, I will not be average, I am going to rebel against being average, I guess it's just been brewing as a combination of things that have happened, experiences that I've gone through. And even going further back, Fred, an intern, first attachment, um, the guy who was responsible for me, there are times he would come to work and he'd be like, oh, you've been here. Oh, you've been here. Can you imagine showing up a place every single day and somebody saying, oh, you've been here. It means that there's nothing you're doing to add value. So it's just that awareness for being average, is equivalent to being ignorable and being ignorable is a huge risk so don't be ignorable well wow, wow. It, it makes so much sense especially when you when you're talking about trying to get better control of your outcomes versus relying on luck and i think i remember i had someone say that luck is not a credible strategy to grow whether it's in life or business that i hope people will find me no you have to promote and put yourself out there 
what are some of the lessons you've learned in your year of putting yourself out there so that you're not being ignored? Mm. What have I learned? Um, How did you overcome the fear, you know? I can only imagine, you know, it's, it's one thing hearing a speaker say, yeah, you know, you should do this for yourself. It's another uh, thing actually doing it. So what what helped you outside of the emotional, someone put a fire beneath your behind and mm. you making the decision? I, think that's I can't serious. imagine how day one is, you know, there's, you're used to having money come in as a direct effort, but when you're doing this for yourself, no money is coming in. So, you know, that's one of the things. Like, how do you deal with that? And what else came up for you as you started? Okay. Um, for clarity, by the way, I, I, I still have a nine to five. Right? I, I still, I am still gainfully employed. I enjoy my job thoroughly. Um, fear to be very honest, it still, it still shows up in my daily life. I wouldn't sit here and be like, yeah, I'm not fearful. I am. I am fearful. But the fear also of somebody ever telling me to my face that if I throw a stone outside, it could hit somebody who will come and replace you. I think if I compare the two fears, just the fear of showing up, my version is less than that, right? And just that desire to be in control of my outcomes, where, like you said, I am not relying on luck to get what I need. It's thoughtful. I've invested. I have planned. I have used the skills that I have that I apply in my daily life, in my life. So what have I seen? I'm here. A year ago, I wouldn't have been with you because... This is not something that, say, for example, I would think I need to speak about or I have something to say that people need to hear. So it's just, you even start seeing opportunities that you wouldn't see. And those are not necessarily monetary opportunities, even just a tribe or people you gel with, people who help you become better. Just this thing for not being average, I've even learned or improved my thought process when it comes to strategy. So I hear yeah, just that understanding or the belief that I'm enough or where I am is sufficient. It didn't put a hunger in me to improve who I am. So I was just, I was just, but then that understanding that there is another level you could unlock that makes you better, that makes you stand out from other people continuous learning, you're learning new things, you're meeting new people, you're exposing yourself to new opportunities. So it's 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 a couple of things and there's the freedom it gives you to just live life a different way, if I could say that. What was the inspiration behind rebelling against average and the value of unclenching in becoming a beast. Okay. Um, <coughs> um, I feel like you, you're cueing me to speak about the high tea that we're going to have for becoming an ignorable. And um, again, going yeah. to people who have unlocked things for you. I have had previously, again, a supervisor who has mentioned that it is impossible to do good work if you're not having fun. I actually agree with him. It is impossible to do good work if you're not having fun. Just think about when you've been able to crack something that was both a renew. Did you do it when you're tense or when you're relaxed? Yeah, the things you remember even about your childhood. I don't know, maybe we are different. I remember more of the fun stuff versus the traumatic or bad stuff. So good things happen in play. An environment where play is allowed, you prosper. So the unignorable high tea is 
it's basically that. It's just a session. It's laid back. You've come with your steaming cup of something and we are discussing or we are bantering about how to become an ignorable. You know, what are you doing today that is limiting yourself or your success or your options? And what can you do about it? So when I say unclench, it's basically relax. Relax. Like even when you see a good ad, just think about the feeling going on in your body. Are you tense or are you relaxed? So it's to say it's like I'm marinating you to do the best version of your work, to do your best work, to be receptive enough. So relax. If I wasn't relaxed, this conversation would not be going on. Right? So value of relaxing. So can you talk a little bit of this high tea experience mm. that you're going to be having? Yeah. Um, again, this I'm borrowing from somebody I've been following for a while. He runs, I would say, he calls them webinars, whatever name he does, but he does it one every two, every two weeks he has one. And it's very useful. I mean, it's just a session where he walks you through the things that helped him get to where he is as a strategist. And they've been so beneficial to me. So if this guy has been running this, he doesn't charge a penny for them. And I can tell you this, he has flipped my career in the recent past. So I guess it's my way of paying forward. If I have unlocked this for myself, just that even that understanding of working with brands, helping them succeed, is actually applicable in my own life. Yet I see people struggle with that on a daily basis. How do I show up? How do I achieve this? How do I get my next job? How do I get that promotion? How do I show up better in my current job? So it's just, I mean, it's, it's to be honest, it's just banter. And it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a laid back conversation on just how to be an ignorable because I've done it for myself. I've done it for brands. So why not do it for other people? And yet I'm benefiting somewhere else. It's just, it's paying it forward. And Opere, I, I know I've said this before, even where I am isn't because I'm so brilliant. It's because other people have helped me succeed. So I'm doing this for other people so they can succeed as well. And hopefully down the line, somebody does the same thing for my kids as well, or even for me in a different space. Wow, wow. This is really mind-blowing and, you know, I don't take this for granted because not a lot of people have that same way of thinking, you know, doing a lot of uh, free career-changing stuff. But to be honest, a lot of us are here because of a lot of information we've gotten for free. You know, some has also been paid. But yes, that's undeniable. You know, just the gifting and how it transforms lives. And, uh, you know, so much can happen because if someone can change, you know, your world can change. And when your world changes, something can shift for you and your life is impacted and you're, you're, you're different, you know. So, you know, what was what was the inspiration just to decide to do it? I can't take that for granted that, oh, yeah, you just woke up and decided I'm doing it, you know? Ooh, ooh. Inspiration for doing it. It's one thing seeing that guy and being inspired, you know. I watch a lot of free content, but that doesn't mean I'm going to start recording and doing free content. So what said, <laughs> what said okay, even me, let me do. One made me think, even me, let me do. First of all, there's just that thing of proving to yourself that I have, I have an, I have a deeply held fear of just attention. I believe I do not like attention. 
but then that should not stop me from putting forward something that's gonna help other people. And how else will people know about being an ignorable? If I've unlocked this for myself, if I don't talk about it, if I don't have the session, how will they know? How will they know? So it's twofold, by the way. First of all, it's a personal dare to myself that, Kavira, you think you have something to say? Let's see you say it, right? And then the second one is, I know this information. I know it. It's I know it. It's in my gut. I know it. When you go to the internet, my experience has been, of course, there'll be free classes, but then there is also a lot of preachy advice. You know, build a brand. Uh, be undeniable. But what are exactly are you saying? Beyond the preaching, can you actually teach what you're saying? So it's, it's just that move from preaching to actually teaching and does it actually make a difference and what are you learning so i guess virtual cycle preach teach learn improve go back at it again yeah wow wow and those of you who are actually listening in a lot of what she's sharing right now is the execution of what's going to happen at that high t so um when, when when is it going to happen so that guys can block off their calendars and tune okay. in get ready okay uh fred thank you uh high tea is going to be on the third of september uh, it's going to be a linkedin live it starts at 8 p.m because i would like everyone to get home from their daily commute chill sit down relax unwind unclench and then brew your favorite cup of whatever it is that you like to then log in online let's have that discussion so it's that september 8 pm the details will be on my linkedin and i can also share those with you then you can put in your show notes yeah but it's open anyone who's willing to rebel against average Karib. wow 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 and before we normally uh, close off, I like playing a small game. Oh my God. So. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. It's okay. In your career, mm -hmm. who are three individuals that you look up to? Because they've provided information that have changed the direction of your career. However, you want to choose to change the direction of your career. Whether it's directly or indirectly. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I have said this to, again, anyone who will bother to give me a listening ear, I love well-written stuff. Whether it's an advertisement, it's a book, it's a movie, it's a song, it's comedy. I love beautiful words. I really do. They make me so happy. So the people who have influenced me will have something to do with writing. I will start with Dave Chappelle. As a stand-up comedian, the link to me is the way he uses his words and the way he socially commentates the things he does is just mind-blowing. So if you can have a human being that is a comedian that moves the world the way he does it's it inspires me i don't want to dare say i want to be a dave chappelle i'm not funny at all but his brain and the way he uses words is so compelling i was so heartbroken when he came to kenya and i didn't get his tickets so dave chappelle is number one um i hear he's coming back in november <laughs> follow, follow, follow stand up. Uh, is it punch? Yes, punchline comedy. Punch. I will. The, the, I will. The, person who, the person who is in charge of punchline comedy is the person who collaborated in bringing him. So you'll probably find the information there. Okay. Uh, you ask the three people who have been influential 
in my career. Correct. Mark Ritson. Mark Ritson is this straight talking guy. He's been running a call-up on marketing week for the longest time. He has a course. I think he's he's just highly featured on YouTube. I like Mark because no nonsense. He separates the riffraff from other stuff and he'll tell you what is BS and what isn't. So I know there's this big debate, say, in the marketing space about differentiation and the impact it has and on digital marketing. So he has very strong opinions and he communicates them. Why I like him is because he challenges what we talk about and what we say. During the Olympics, there was all this banter about what you're going to learn from the guy who was shooting without equipment. And he did an article saying, by the guys, stop your BS. Yeah, I know you're trying to build all these correlations between Olympians and business, but it's like running a business is hard work, right? Like two minutes of shooting on target cannot be extrapolated into a business. So we all need to calm down. And I liked the way, you know, that guy who smacks you at the back of your head and gets you back to reality. So I like Mark, Mark Ritson for that. No bullshit. Straight talker. I like that. The third person who's had an effect on my marketing would be Rory, Rory Sutherland. He's something or the other for Ogilvy. But what I like about him in my life, he introduced this notion or thought process of behavioral economics. I didn't even know that was a thing. So this is where you use human behavior to hack the outcomes you want. I'll give you an example. If today you're sick for whatever reason and you're given an antibiotic, you have to take that antibiotic. If you don't take it to completion, you're done. You, next time you become sick, you're not getting better. So a simple hack would be if your antibiotics come as pills, we can game you. We can tell you these first two pills are pink in color. Take them the first two days. There will be three. I mean, sorry, two maybe in white color. Take them the next two days and there'll be one orange one. You finish. According to research, and I know research is something we throw around, it's easier for you to complete that dosage than if I give you five white pills. Because Nico Kona milestones, you're hitting. I finished the pink. I'm finishing the orange. I'm finishing the white. Yeah. And I just like the way the guy thinks, to be honest. It, it is... He... I like his school of thought. So Mark Ritson, Rory, and Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle will feature in everything. Even finances, you ask me, I'll be like Dave Chappelle. So, yeah. You gotta manage your money properly. Yeah, <laughs> that's my I'll poor like attempt of trying to imitate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. three people who you'd love to collaborate with on a marketing project or a marketing campaign, and it doesn't matter. Money does not matter. Time have, and death does not matter. It can be someone who's passed away if they are still here. You know, time or distance doesn't matter. You can get to them and they are available. Which are three individuals you'd love to do a project <sighs> and what kind of project? Okay. I love I love how copywriters think. I I because Copy is not just about the words, it's the idea behind the words. So it, without a question, it has to be somebody who is in the copywriting space. Has to be. So uh, there's a guy called Dan Neckel. Neckel. I don't even pronounce it that right. But if you search for him on LinkedIn, his profile, you know, you write all these things, 15 years, I've been making people undeniable. I simplify the complex in any name. His is very simple. He says that your inner critic is a dingdong. That's it. And it's 
it's it's a nod to how much of his life he wasted critiquing himself and stopping himself from doing what he should have been doing because he didn't think he was good enough the way that guy uses words or better the way he uses words his newsletter as an example his call to action is subscribe today and subscribe tomorrow uh, yeah it's him for sure it's him as a copywriter it's him uh all of them will be copywriters. There is a guy called the Word Man. He's UK based. Again, very alternative the way he thinks. Even the way he writes copy for websites. I mean, if you go to a website, he's done copy for. I think he did the website for UAE before the shopping festival. That's typically there between December, I think January, February. He delivers. He can... He can sell you saliva in your own time and you would buy it. So it has to be him. I said I love words. So. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, those, are, those are two? The third one, it still has to be a copywriter. I'll just go with Dave Chappelle because I think we'd have such a good time. Have you've used you've used your Dave Chappelle card. Use another one now. Ah, and your Dave Chappelle. So, so, so we are clear. Dave Chappelle is there. You just want another one. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, what are three three movies you've watched that? Okay, three movies. What are you watching now? And three movies that are your your your, your go to, or it can be movies or TV series. <coughs> ah, how much time do we have? <laughs> huh? How much time do we have? Um, I guess because of the U.S. elections, I went back and completed House of Cards. Yeah, I, Jesus. Let me tell you, if I had time, I would start again from season one. It's just that I don't have the time. And I think at some point I got too exhausted with the story and everything. But House of Cards is something that I've been watching of late. You said movies. Movies. Um, Wolf of Wall Street. I like when I watch a movie and... I forget that I'm alive or I'm living a life outside of it. So Wolf of Wall Street, very good movie. Pace, theatrics, the storyline, the lines in that movie. Words, again, I, I have a thing for words. So Wolf of Wall Street, amazing movie. <clears throat> the other one will be a bit of an old school. If you see... By now, 2008 is old school, Silvio. <laughs> sure. It is. Yeah, so it's called Rock and Roller. It's a movie by Guy Ritchie. It's... I remember it's the poster. A, you do. Oh, my God. So it's... The, the, the it's a, bare, bare-chested... Uh, a guy with guns, right? Yes. Yeah, so... Again, it's comedy and it's crime and... The storyline there, you know, there is a scene that just starts, and this, what do you call him? He's a drug addict. He's just playing the piano and delivering the most epic lines I've ever had in a movie. So, rock and roller, movies, movies, I, um, movies, movies, Wall Street, da 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 da. I think I've given you the other one, House of Cards, something that I'm Okay, yes, yeah, so you, 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 yeah. you, you've given three. Yeah. What are three books, maybe something you're reading now that's impactful or, or books that have just shifted uh, the way you think? Okay. Uh, whew, the one I will not forget, again, I mean, the value of the people in your life previous MD, we used to have a book club. It's called The Richest Man in Babylon. 
it's such a small book. I don't know if you'll allow me to do props, but it's somewhere. It's richest exactly. one in Babylon. So it basically helps you to deal with finances. It helps you. It helps you deal with finances. It's basically, and I remember the way the guy introduced it. He was like, this is a book I read every year. This one. It's not a big book. It's not a wide book. It's set in like Babylon times, so to speak. And it helps you know how to manage your currency, your money in very simple terms. So the guy will tell you, don't take advice from people you don't want to be. You know, protect your past. It has very old, like, you know, again, this guy is talking coins because that's the time the book is set in. It's not about your Bitcoin. So it's a control thy expenditures, protect thine past. Uh, the power of compound interest, you know, you have an investment somewhere, you're getting your 18, 12 percent, whatever amount you're getting. Then you, when the interest is paid, you take the interest and you go share. Then the next year you start. If you look at yourself three years down the line, the person who reinvests their 12K as part of principle, the growth they have versus you who takes away your interest is very different. So... This one for sure. I'll answer your question with recency bias. It will probably be a book I've read recently. Um, it's called Essentialism. So it's the disciplined pursuit of doing less. I think there's a notion of do more. The idea is to do less impactful things. You don't have to do everything. And the other in one. Fact, in, 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 in fact, uh... I mean, this men's book, Breakfast, and that's one of the books for this actually quote, and I actually chose the book. So how would you describe the experience of that book? I will say this. Uh, it will flip your life. Make sure you read the book. Yeah, it's, it's, ah, it's, a, it's a good book. It's a good book. Um, the other one, please don't kill me for this. It's okay. These are your recommendations or whatever it is you're experiencing. Okay. The other book is a recommendation by Dave Chappelle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you won't kill me. With... No. You will not kill me. No. <laughs> so you won't. It's called Pimp. Uh, it's called Pimp Chronicles. So it's a book by Iceberg Slim. He was a pimp in like 1970s in Chicago. Real life, this guy wrote a book. Let me tell you, have you ever read a book and you're like, if tomorrow or if somebody gives me an option to watch Netflix, I'll be like, no, thank you. I'll read my book. Gripping. So it would be that. It's Iceberg Slim, it's called the Pimp. It's called Pimp Chronicles or Pimp. Can't quite tell. This and Essentialism. If we have more time, I can, but for now, it's just cap it at that. Yes, in fact, uh, I've just also remembered the uh, part of the game of threes after the three people who you wanted to work with uh, and time, money, and death are not a factor. Also, what are three marketing books you would recommend? But you've read that changed your life. <laughs> it, it, it changed my life. Um, or changed your career or shifted it. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. Perspective, yeah. Yes. Um, the first one is free. It's very free. It has, you will not spend a single dime on it. It's called JWT Guide to Planning. I don't know who or what JWT means, but it's basically 37 pages. Um, it premises the thoughtfulness that goes beyond planning for a brand. So what makes a successful brand? Who are you planning for? What do you need to get right in your campaigns, in your research, in what you're getting right? The other one will be a book called the Alchemy by Rory Sutherland. He was one of my people. Um, 
the premise is very simple that logic sometimes kills creativity. Yeah, so it's not about logic all the time. Or sometimes when you get stuck with something, you know, you're unable to crack something, take a break. Again, it goes to that thing of unclenching. Take a break. You'll be in the middle of your shower or in the middle of your dream and it will just come to you. So Rory premises that sometimes logic is not the best thing. So think about this. Uh, if you're an army general, you're going to war. It's me versus Opere, right? We are going to fight tomorrow. And as a general in charge of that war, I use logic. I'm going to lose. Why? Because that's what's expected. But if I'm creative, or if I do the anti-logic, I'm likely to win. So it's, it's a lot of things, but the essence is don't just purely rely on your logic. Sometimes magic or creativity is just as powerful. Oof, another book for marketing. Honestly, I, I can't. I can't think of another one. Rory, JWT. Marketing, marketing, marketing. Oh, God. I guess, I guess a textbook then. <laughs> that works. Uh, I can see I have a tipping point. How to influence people since it's on my shelf. It just it, you know Is that is that a marketing textbook or that's the Dale Carnegie book? It's it's general, but wouldn't you say it applies to everything? Can Correct. Yeah, yeah, I'd say that. Because the rest are very textbook centered. It's Pearson, marketing strategy and competition positioning. It's too heavy. If you don't have an exam or a project you're working on, then it's very difficult to consume it. But has it changed how I think? Yes. Oh, and design thinking. <coughs> Sorry. Who's, do you remember the author? Mm, no, but I'm sure I'll give you the title. You can always put it down below. And how yeah. did it shift things for you? Um, you can actually systemize how you think. You can. You can. You can you can repeat what the way you think and the success you have, you can make it repeatable by having a system of doing things so that you succeeded in a multinational, you can succeed in a small business, you can succeed in your own space because there is a way of doing things. Wow, wow. And before we, we finish things off, we've done three books, we've done three movies, and then three artists or songs whether it's something current or uh, something you've listened to which is your go-to when you're when you're having fun or when you're down or whatever just you know uh, <clears throat> this we are clear you asked me the same question two hours from now it will change i know but i understand I'm, totally okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so music Bien Navutishwa. I I such a beautiful, beautiful words. Again, I just every time I hear that song, by the way, I rarely play it once, it's always on repeat. And um I love Bruno Mars, so if you ever leave me, baby, Bruno Mars, leave some more things. So that one and this is just a high energy song by, it's called TIA. It's, I don't know who the artist is. It's just called TIA, but it's very high energy. So I think the guy is called RJ something, but it's good music, okay. high energy. Pick me up. Because the TIA I was thinking of was uh, by the guy that did a zone to fuse. I think he also did TIA. If I remember correctly, I could be. 
you know. Uh, the the difference here will be this one. This one is not an acronym. The song is actually just called T Tia by oh, R J okay. R J Caniera. So it's okay. Tia R J Caniera. It's one of those boppers. If you're listening to it and you say still, we need to do something. Something is wrong. <laughs> it, no, we need to do something. There's nothing wrong. We just need to do something. Wow, wow. Thank you very much for this undeniably unignorable conversation. I have learned so much. And before we sign off, maybe you, could you mind just giving us your, your, your parting shot from just uh, this small taste of yours and what to expect from the high tea okay. experience coming soon? <clears throat> okay. So first up, Andrew, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I've genuinely enjoyed myself so thank you um but in short i want to challenge mortals so basically if you're alive just get into the habit of rebelling against being average because average it just doesn't pay off it doesn't give you the freedom you deserve it doesn't give you the life you deserve to wake up to it doesn't give you control over your outcome so rebel against being average just be unignorable wow well there you heard it yourself mortals change your lives and rebel against the average stop denying yourself the gift sleeping inside of you are you ready to unleash the beast <laughs> wow well, well, thank you very much irambu kawira i'm looking forward to being unignorable coming soon next week so put it in your calendar and even though uh, uh past that date this conversation is has is full packed with utility if an individual are you open to entrepreneurs individuals that need uh help with branding with marketing with having an audit of their brand, what they can do, what fundamentals are they not putting together properly? How can they grow their business? How can they maintain what they've got already? Uh, are they, are you in a position to interact with them and give them the coaching or your expertise uh, to help them with that? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I think that's, we try to be humble here. But yeah, um, I think I, I, I keep saying I don't want to have the coach title next to my name because I feel as though it will likely even invalidate what I do and what I love to do when I wake up in the morning, which is to create successful okay, brands I'll say and enjoyable brands. Yeah. And it takes a lot of research, learning, strategy, all those things. I think the minute you put a coach precursor to your name is as though it back it boxes you into something. So the understanding here is I know how to work with brands. What I'm promising is what works for a brand can work for you as an individual. So do I know how to help that work for you as an individual? Yes. Do I do it? Yes. So you can and you should reach out. I do that. I do that. Yes. I help people become unignorable. And ignorable. So whether you're going through a transition or you feel you've lost the desire or you're lost, you don't know what you want even if you know what you don't want. So those are conversations we can have in that whatever the relationship you want to call it, but yes, I, I do. And how's the best way that they can reach you? Your uh, preferred way? My preferred way, again, I have to go back to what I have just preached. I have to make it easy for the people to reach me. So it's not about my preferences. Provided it doesn't kill me, number one, you can DM me on LinkedIn. Uh, number two, I have a number I am reachable on, 
0734-677-088. So you can either reach me on LinkedIn or you can reach me on that number. You can even WhatsApp if that's your preference. You can send a message if it's your preference. So. All right. Thank you very much. You've been tuned in to the Revenge of the Forsaken Gods podcast, a podcast where I interview professionals to share values that are not really being practiced because society hasn't really taught you about it, maybe because they've been ignored by the mainstream culture, so that once you're aware of these values, you can now attempt to practice them in your life because the consequences of not practicing them are the results you're getting, you know, not being all you can be. And that's what I call in tongue in cheek, the revenge. So that is the revenge of the forsaken gods. You're experiencing the full course of the values you are not applying in your lives, values that will make your life move forward, be undeniable, be unignorable. And if you've heard one thing that has moved your life forward, I would love to hear that. Please share it in the comments below or feel free to send it out at Revenge F Gods on all platforms, X, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok, uh, wherever you feel, because your feedback helps me know what what you resonate with. And if you'd like, if there's anything you've heard from Kawira that you'd love her to go in depth with, please uh, let us know. Go ahead and DM me at Revenge of God so that we can get her back here because my aim is also to do an in-depth masterclass on an aspect of branding or marketing. So please go ahead and download her books. I'll put them in the show notes. You can help, uh, they'll help you audit your business. What have you done for your business? What have you not done for your business? Do your best to make sure you show up for the high tea. And if you have found any value in this, this is free. It'll help me grow. I would appreciate if you'd like, subscribe on YouTube, on subscribe on Spotify if you're listening to it there, and share with a friend so that you can help me grow just the same way. It is my objective for you to grow with information that will help you move your life forward. So thank you for watching or listening. The Revenge of the Forsaken Gods. I've been your host, Andrew Belongo Perry, and you have been listening to a conversation with Irambu Kavira, the fussy one who is very hardworking. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. All right. Have a good one.